when I came here, I got to have a tour up in the attic in the back and see all the pipes. It's the first time I've heard them with breath. Uh, and they're beautiful. Well, it has been rumored on the internet that during the past two years, there's been some division, apparently, in the churches and in the United States. I don't know. I, I guess it's possible. What do you do with friends and family, the people you love and do life with, but because they can't stuff down the fear and anger anymore, they always need to vent, leaving you emotionally drained? What do you do with the stranger the Lord brings across you on your path and they verbally unload on you? What do you do when your own need to fight back gets aroused? Your righteous anger arises and you need to push back and fight to restore order in your world. What do you do with the people whom you love, whom you've been avoiding, or the people who've been avoiding you, each waiting for the other to finally come to their senses and see the truth? Well, John, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, and one of the big three of Jesus' Jesus's inner circle, Peter, James, and John, had much of the same problems. He went from sharing a nickname with his brother, the Sons of Thunder, to becoming known as the Apostle of Love. Today we're going to look at some of his story. The Apostle John was born into a troubled nation full of anger and division. Like many of us, they used the Bible to proof text their ungodlike character. His world was full of zealots, Pharisees, governmental corruption, greedy tax collectors, and traitors to the faithful, pretty much like our world today. Fearful and angry anti-authority Christians, fearful and angry compliant Christians, Christians caught up in the spirit of the times. Some are calling down the wrath of God. Others are calling down the wrath of the government. But most people just want to duck and cover until sanity returns and everyone learns to get along. I know God is long-suffering, but why does God covenant and bind himself with such fallen and broken people to, f to fulfill his purposes for creation? I mean, seriously, Lord, it's, it's embarrassing. Give me 24 hours on the throne, and I'll fix it. No? Well, the long way then. I'll, bel I'll belittle their intelligence and moral character with memes on Facebook until they finally come to their senses, grow a brain, and maybe a spine, and finally see that my side was right all along. They'll admit they were wrong, get with the program, and fellowship will be restored. It's time for a come to Mises meeting. <laughs> Just speaking the truth in love. Oh yeah, ooh, there's a good one. <clears throat> That'll fix you. That'll show you what a cretin you are, you moron. Ow. What? Oh, man. I'm out of power. The animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews is centuries old. It's religious, it's political, a divided kingdom, each with their own king, each one more corrupt than the last. It's being abandoned during times of uh, national defense. It's deep-seated wounds and prejudice. Now, Rome is in charge. Caesar is Lord, and, they are, and all they have left are social prejudice, religious strife, and old wounds. We get a taste of this history in the story of the woman at the well. When Jesus asked a Samaritan woman for some water to drink, she brings up a long-standing, hot topic, source of division between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans say to worship on this mountain, but the Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem. Well, which is it? I don't know if she really wanted to know or if she was just trying to bait into getting Jesus into trouble. But Jesus answers, The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. 
Now, ironically, Jesus sets his face to pass through Samaria and go to Jerusalem, not because they have their religious act together, but to be betrayed and killed by the very same people these Samaritans hate. Jesus could have started trash-talking the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas, Herod, and Caesar. And the same Samaritan town would have greeted him with an enthusiastic two thumbs up. But Jesus being Jesus is always doing Jesus. Choosing instead to focus on abiding and worshiping the Father in spirit of truth and reconciliation. Our scripture text today Is from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. John has been traveling with Jesus for three years. In the preceding sections of Luke chapter 9, John has seen some pretty amazing things. Jesus gives the apostles authority over all demons. The Father reveals through Peter that Jesus is not John the Baptist, not Elijah, but the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, James, and John see Jesus transfigured literally glorified with their own eyes, and he's speaking with Moses and Elijah, the great heroes of the Old Testament. They hear the voice of God, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Jesus says the least among you is the one who is great. John, like David, who became king over his older brothers, was the youngest and the least. Jesus says, the one who is not against you is for you. But what about the people who are against us? People with old prejudices and new insults. Luke 9, 51. Now when it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. As they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command down fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are from, what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. John, like all of us, was a product of his times, an incarnation of his culture with all its strengths and weaknesses, enlightenments, prejudices and blind spots. He was a product of centuries-old hatred between Jews and Samaritans. He was a, a product of centuries of occupation by foreign invaders. Whatever spirit you're breathing in, you will breathe out. Children in biblical times did not have cartoon superheroes like Superman and Spider-Man. I love that. Reset. As good Jewish boys wanting to fight bad guys, James and John had heroes from Bible stories. Heroes like Moses, David, Gideon, Samson, and Elijah. I can see John as a boy pretending he is Elijah the super prophet, calling down fire on a sandbox of evil armies and, and evil armies and the enemies of God in Israel. Pagans like worshipers of Baal. Pagans like the armies of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. Pagans like the uncircumcised Philistines. Pagans like the Roman soldiers occupying their land. Traitors like the Samaritans who are worse than pagans because they worshipped, because they were supposed to be one of us. And they worshipped foreign gods. I can see John above his sandbox with a pile of rocks calling down the wrath of God to destroy all the bad guys. Kaboom! <laughs> Booyah! What blows my mind is the adult John has been seeing Jesus do Jesus every day for three years. And John still seems to think that Jesus would be okay 
with him calling down fire. That after three years with Jesus, John perhaps thinks he's being tested to see if he has enough faith to call down fire from heaven and join the greatest club. Why else would Jesus have brought John to the Mount of, Trans to the Mount of Transfiguration but to see his hero Elijah? John, this is it. It's time to take your shot. You Jewish boys are far from home. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Shalom to you too. Here's our traditional Jewish greeting for you. <laughs> Don't lift a finger. That was a warning. Try it again and see what happens. Quiet, Big James. Shalom to you too. <laughs> oh, you filthy dogs! I said quiet. Let us do something. And what would that achieve? Defending your honor. They reviled and humiliated you. They deserve to have bolts of lightning rain down and incinerate them. Yes, fire from the heavens. Fire? You said we could do things like that. Say the word and it will happen. Why not? We knew we couldn't trust these people. We shouldn't have come here in the first place. They don't deserve you. Hmm. I love that scene from The Chosen. They don't deserve you. And just who are the bad guys, these enemies of God, not deserving of Jesus' love and mercy? Everyone who does, perhaps everyone who does not think and act according to how we read our Bibles. Maybe everyone who seems to be getting away with stuff we want to do, but don't do because the Lord's telling us not to. We call this jealousy righteous anger to justify lashing out. These people who dishonor God and bring judgment on our nation. We need to stop them. We need to control them and fix them. Then they will be deserving of his love. Then they will be like us and be safe to worship with. Unleash divine justice to turn a few into grease smears. And the rest will fall into line and give God the honor and love and grace he deserves. I miss us. Who are the people in your life who you once worshiped before the throne of grace and no longer have fellowship? Fellowship that has been broken over our different stances on politics? Broken over our different stances on how to respond to COVID? Broken over our different stances on social justice? Broken over our different stances on expressing social anger? Broken over our different stances on freedom of speech. Broken over our different stances on fact, -checker, fact checkers and censorship. Broken over our different stances on reliable sources of news. Broken over our different stances on what constitutes good science or in bad science. Broken over our different stances on safety. Broken over our different stances on freedom. Broken over our different stances on fiscal responsibility broken over our different stances on what constitutes social responsibility. The body of my son is broken. What manner of spirit? I'm not saying these issues are not important. They are. For some, on both sides, they're a matter of life and death. For some, on both sides, they're the difference between sickness and health. For some, on both sides, they're the difference between financial security or ruin. But do you know what manner of spirit you are on the inside? Whose spirit are you breathing in? Into whose image are you being transformed? You wanted to use the power of God to bring down fire, to burn these people up? Well, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. <laughs> it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. It always sounds a lot worse when we shine the light and presence of Christ upon our 
righteous actions. And we finally see what was obvious to everyone but ourselves. We are operating from a very different spirit. But Jesus does not kick James and John out of his fellowship. Instead, he draws them in closer so that his character can rub off on them. Half-truths are truth broken. There is probably nothing more dangerous than a half-truth, whether in politics, science, religion, theology. Half-truths puffed up by biblical proof text divorced from the character of Christ. Our justifications melt before the presence of Christ, who is the full revelation of the Father. Man, I can hear John's thoughts, but Jesus, the, the Bible, the, Elijah, psh, 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 booyah. Is it my timing? Maybe you really do want to fry them, but, but not right now, later. My proof text says yes, but your face in your character says no. It's the wrong spirit no matter what time. Lord, does your mercy ever end? Some say God is love, but he's also a God of justice. For some, his mercy comes to an end and God switches to endless torment. Some say God has a big but, but he's a God of justice. I think everything Jesus said and did proves that that is but a big lie. Scripture says God is love and God is one. And God never changes. Listening to what others claim Scripture says about God's justice, about his justice being in conflict with his love, is a poor substitute for the full revelation of the Father revealed in Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples and directly to Philip, Have I been, when they asked him to, sh- to stay, when they wanted to see the Father, what's he really like? And Jesus said, Have I been with you so long and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? So, So what do we do with Elijah and the Old Testament prophets when at times they seem so different than Jesus? Do I justify their actions? Do I imitate them instead of imitating Jesus? Sometimes when I'm in the wrong spirit, I want to. Do I judge and reject them? Do I throw out the Old Testament? Do I demand they should behave as if they had had the full revelation of Jesus? Sometimes I want to. There are many things that God permits his chosen people to do that is recorded in Scripture and throughout history. Things contrary to the character of Christ as revealed in the Gospels. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Do you want to have ears that hear? Pause the endless media streaming. Pause the accusing and excusing the moral contribution of those who came long before you in a world that only spoke and responded to harsh action. Let the Spirit use their stories to reveal the thoughts and intentions of my own heart. Breathe in the fire and hear what the Spirit is saying. Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. Breathe him in. When you are confused about the Old Testament, do what the disciples did on the road to Emmaus. Walk with Jesus and talk with him. Let him interpret all that the scriptures say about himself. Do you want to see the Son? Release him from being the genie of your agenda, the engine of your enterprise, in the excuse for your unrighteousness. Walk with him. 
Abide with him. Let him gather you to his chest. Feel his breath upon you. Breathe in the fire and know him as he truly is. Jesus and the Father are one. There is nothing, there is nothing unchristlike in the Father. When your vision of God turns dark and the spirits of this age are goading you into calling down fire from heaven, hit pause. Pause and turn once again to Jesus. Let him breathe upon you. Receive his breath and breathe in his fire. Breathe in the fire. Take the coal from the altar. Cleanse your lips. Receive his rebuke. Let him cleanse your heart. His justice flows from his love, repaying evil with good. Breathe in the fire and breathe out the good. Breathe in the fire, take in the breath of God, and breathe out welcome to all those missing from your table. Breathe in the fire. Breathe in Christ and be transformed into his image. And breathe out his presence to a world that is lost and spiraling into despair. We do this by abiding in Christ in rhythms of communion, community, and ministry. That's how we do that. Communion, encountering restoration, presence, abiding. Jesus regularly took time to seek solitude from the community of his disciples in order to be alone with the Father. If Jesus needed that, how much more do we? The Father is in Christ and Christ is in us by the Holy Spirit. They are one. Regularly take time to breathe in the spirit of the Trinitarian presence. Breathe out their presence, minute by minute, day by day, until the very last breath of your mortal life. And then keep on breathing in the fire of divine love. Father, into your hands I surrender my worries, my fears, my control, my rights, my finances, my health, all that I am. With my last breath, I surrender my spirit into your unending union of perfect love, justice, and mercy that restores all things. I come to the end of myself. I am undone. Broken on the rock of Christ, the ground of being, in whom, by whom, and for whom all things exist. In him I am lost, in him I am found. I hear his voice, beloved, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, child. You are mine. In the stillness and quiet of contemplation, we experience his still, small voice. From friend to bride. From servant to friend. From friend to bride. From bride to one spirit, one body. In him we breathe in the fire. And in him we breathe out as one. I in you. And you in me. And not just me and God alone but all of us are becoming perfectly one in him. Jesus' prayer in John 17, 20 is being fulfilled. Father, I pray they would be one as you and I are one. Let's take a moment to practice this. I was going to do a full minute, but... We're going to do shorter. Slowly, gently, reverently, call on the name of the Lord. Perhaps Jesus or Abba or Spirit. 
You may close your eyes or let, the, let your gaze rest upon the cross. Jesus. 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 I and you and you and me. Ask the Lord, in what activities do I experience you most deeply? Maybe it's walking. Maybe sitting in your favorite chair when the house is quiet. Maybe working in your garden. Maybe tinkering in your garage. Maybe while drawing or singing. Maybe an imaginative prayer. Maybe in the silence of contemplation. Where does the veil of this world grow thin for you and you become more aware of God's presence? Express gratitude for the ways the Lord has blessed you to experience experience the awareness of his presence. Commit to making space and time to abide with the Lord in this gift. So Father, I, I thank you for the way I experience you when I walk. Lord, help me to get out of the house (laughs) and walk because you're always there waiting for me. In communion, we join the Father, Son, and Spirit at the table. We breathe in the fire of their love. We experience them as one. Community our second rhythm of abiding. After times in solitude with the Father, as was Jesus' habit, he returned to the community of his disciples. When we come down from the holy mountain of communion, the divine fire that was so hot, so clear, begins to cool and become clouded. We begin breathing in less and less of the holy fire and more and more of the spirit of this age, forgetting who we truly are And once again, we seek to use the authority of God to secure our own control, security, and affection. Without frequent times in solitude alone with the Lord, we become manipulative and controlling persons, destroying the very community we long for. In community that is spiritually healthy, we begin, we each bring an ember of the holy fire of God's presence Once again, we see true reality, that is, God in his kingdom. Together, we breathe deeply of the divine fire and let it burn away the dross of our souls. Where there is fear, we breathe out hope. Where there is anger, we breathe breathe out reconciliation. Where there is injury, we breathe out restoration. Where there is curse, We bring out blessing. Breathe in the fire and breathe out life-giving community. Now ask the Lord. Lord, (laughs) with whom can I partner in this love? With whom do I experience you? With whom do I experience you in our midst as naturally as breathing? Whose names and faces are coming up? Commit yourself to make space and time for these people. This is the low-hanging fruit in our life of community. In community, we come to the table the Lord and I experience God's love for me flowing through you 
And you experience God's love for you flowing through me. In Christ, we are becoming one. In Christ, we also reserve a place for those with whom community is difficult. Those who rub us the wrong way. God is using them to rub off our rough edges, making us jointly fit, a living temple of his relentless love, a bride made beautiful. Our third rhythm of abiding, mission. Take up your cross and follow me. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. And in communities of two or more, he calls us to join him in spirit-filled mission. What is our mission? What is my mission? To breathe in the fire of transforming love and breathe it out and breathe it out in blessing to a lost and dying world. Well, where should I go? What should I do? The world is full of the spirit of this age, creating division, falsehoods, propaganda, fear, anger, power struggles, political corruption, social discord, isolation, corporate greed, and religious corruption. Folks, it's a target-rich environment for the relentless love of God. You can't miss. Breathe in the fire of God's relentless love, and with two or more, go and breathe out his relentless love in word and deed. Breathe in the fire of divine love and breathe out action in the character of Christ. Breathe out words of blessing and acts of kindness. So ask the Lord, Lord, in what corner of darkness and captivity is your soul rising up in my heart Is your love rising up in my soul to fill with your holy fire? Bring one difficult person to mind to whom you want me to breathe out the love of Christ. Lord, I surrender my desire to fix them, to set them straight. I surrender my desire to coerce them to comply and see and do things my way. I accept your invitation to simply sit with them and see them through your eyes to breathe in your fire and breathe out the sweet aroma of the love and presence of Christ upon their soul. To see and listen and bear witness to their pain their fear, and their anger, and simply be a non-judgmental vessel of your holy, loving presence. Come to the table with all that you are, not just your best self. All that we do in life is an invitation to abide with Jesus in living life together with him, with one another, I and you, and you and me, us and them. God making us perfectly one. Communion fills us with the Lord who then sends us forth to gather in community and to experience the Lord in our midst. Then the Lord sends us in small communities of two or more to join him him in his mission for others to experience his loving presence. To taste and see that the Lord is good. It's not your correction that people need. It's the taste of the Lord. As we are poured out with Christ, we breathe out Christ. Sometimes this is joyful. Sometimes this is painful. Sometimes it'll get us crucified but we lose our life only to find it. And we return once again to communion to breathe in the fire of his holy love. After the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, John does get the call down fire on the Samaritans. In Acts chapter eight, John and Peter are sent to Samaria to lay hands on the Samaritan believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Breathe in the fire and partake fully at the table of the Lord as full sons and daughters of the living God, 
one Father, one Lord, one body, one holy fire. Little children, breathe in the fire and know the spirit you are of. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he blessed it. He said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. Eat of me. For I am true food for your soul. In the same manner, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave thanks. This is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for all men, for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So remember him. Remember his character, his love, his actions. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Receive their spirit. Breathe them in. Let the holy fire of his presence transform you from within to set you free from the captivity of sin. That when we see him, we will be like him. The Lord's presence is always, always with you. There is no place you can escape it. Whether seen or unseen, felt or unfelt, the Lord is with you and the Lord is for you. So Father, let your fire fall from heaven into the very core of our beings and burn with your love Because, Lord, this is impossible to do in our own strength. So fill us with your love. Fill us with your presence. Transform us into the image of Jesus. Lord, we choose to follow you into the world to breathe out the sweet aroma of your presence. In Jesus' name, receive the gospel. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And in Jesus' name, in Jesus' breath, in Jesus' fire, be the gospel. Amen.